Hello, we have Wesley. Hello. All right, and of course you're getting the back of my head. Um, there's just no good way of doing this. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, we have a fantastic seminar today. We have five amazing researchers with us and Steph and I started putting together their bios and realized I would actually take the entire class time reading all their accomplishing accolades. So what we're going to do is allow them to introduce themselves as they're speaking. We have actually printed out their bios for you all and circulated them around so you can read these wonderful bios at their leisure. And we can use all of our time for discussion and Q&A. And so I'm gonna start with Dr. Lavieri and hand it over to you, Marielle, to kind of get us started, however you would like to organize this. And I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna mess anything more up, but if I do, my apologies, let's go. Yes, Same of on. course. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen uh, with you. Um, hmm. I think I can share this one and I will get, uh, so can everybody see, sure. Okay, did it work? Can people see it? Yes. Can people hear me in the room? Yes. All right, this works, that's awesome, okay. So it's a truly a pleasure to be here today. As uh, Professor Cohn mentioned, my name is Maria Lavieri and I'm faculty in the School of Industrial and Operations Engineering. And uh, I'm here as part of a team. So even though I'm the first one speaking, <laughs> I'm by no means the first one here. It's uh, we are a team and we are all work together. We have been working together for quite a while. And, uh, and our work has been on understanding supply and demand of organ transplants in the US. We have as part of our team, and I will just say it in the order I have, we have it in the screen. Uh, we have uh, Wesley, he used to be Wesley Marrero. He used to be a former PhD student in our department, and now he's a postdoc at Harvard. And he is uh, gonna be starting at Rutgers uh, very soon. There is also Luke, uh, current PhD student in the department. Uh, candidate, so not just student, PhD candidate. We have uh, David Hutton, who has a lot of affiliations with our departments, but he also comes from the School of uh, Public Health and has provided great uh, input from that part. It's awesome to find a collaborator who knows both uh, industrial engineering, but now also has a, a big feeling of uh, public health. And also uh, we have uh, Nihar uh, Parikh, uh, Dr. Parikh, who is uh, in the School of Medicine, who can actually tell us about the problem at hand. I should also mention that today we may be having some of our students uh, join this call. And uh, there have been many undergraduate students that have participated in, the, in this work. I should mention the uh, current students, uh, Bei Ming, Ji Fang, Hannah, Annabelle, and we also had Yuhang that be part of this work. But again, uh, we only put some of them, so that's why I said including another, all of the students that have participated today in, in this work. So with that being said, uh, let me start just by introducing the problem at hand. Let me see if I do pull a presentation, if that works out fine. And for the rest of the speakers, uh, we, I can, I'm happy to be the one that passes the slides. So you just uh, nod to me or you say next slide if somehow I don't pass it and I will be passing the slides for everybody that way we are all together. So let me see. I don't know if we can just, Slideshow, I think, looks uh, nicer. All right, so with that being said, I, like I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about the imbalance of supply and demand of organ transplants in the US. And what we thought we would do is, uh, this is our outline. We would first tell you why we care about the problem. <laughs> and that's gonna be done by Nihar. So he has a lot of expertise in the organ transplantation and he can tell us a little bit about what organ transplantation is about and why is that an issue in the US. Once we do that, Wesley is gonna take over and he's gonna be take, talking about some of our first papers we wrote on the field. It was basically before we can fix a problem, we have to understand the problem. And so we spent time understanding the supply and demand of organs. It's not enough to say there is a problem. How big of a problem is it now? And uh, what do we think the problem might look like in the future? So that was uh, two of uh, two papers we wrote at the time that Wesley is gonna be summarizing for you. Then he's, we are gonna be talking about some of the things we can do to address that supply demand imbalance of organs. 
And one of the papers we have written is an organ um, implied consent that was done by Luke. So he's gonna be the one uh, talking about it. But before he talks about it, uh, David will introduce the issue and mention to us, how do we measure the type of changes that uh, implied consent could bring? And finally, I will finish this talk by just telling you a little bit about some of our other work that we couldn't fit in within this, uh, this amount of time. But uh, with that being said, I don't wanna take all the time. So I let uh, Nihar go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mariel, um, and thanks everyone uh, for having us. Uh, my name is Nihar Parikh. I'm in the School of Medicine. I'm a um, liver transplant uh, medical physician. So I help take care of patients and work them up prior to their liver transplant and afterwards. And you know, I've been working with this group now for about seven years, and it's been such a it's been a you know a great part of my time here at the university um, because it kind of you know makes me think outside of our day-to-day -day clinical uh, scenarios and think about these big problems that we're trying to understand. So, uh, you know, my job here is to give you a little bit of an introduction about, um, you know, why this is an important problem and why it's kind of uniquely suited towards, you know, an IOE type of mindset to try to really figure this out a bit. So, you know, I think the first point I want to bring up is kind of the history of transplant. You know, uh, the, this um, transplant is a relatively young field. And we're figuring things out kind of on the fly. Um, and so I think people don't really realize that, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, transplant is over, pretty much young, pretty young. So the first kidney transplant was in 1954. The first liver was in 1967. And the first heart was in 1968. But you know, in the, initially a lot of these transplants, um, the outcomes are really poor. Um, they uh, had very poor graft survival in the recipient of the transplant. And you know, people didn't do well. So we showed that we could do this technically, but it's not really the outcomes that we were looking for. In 1983, a drug called cyclosporin, which is an immunosuppressive medication, was introduced and released. And that really was one of the first things to, to improve uh, outcomes after organ transplantation. And you know, what that resulted in is there, there, you know, we started to do more transplants because outcomes were better. But then we started running into the shortage of transplantation. Next slide. So you know, you know, there are benefits that we can uh, that are pretty clear. We can improve survival. Um, the the major solid organs that we transplant right now are heart, lung, kidney, and liver. And these are patients with that you know their organs are not working or they're they're in failure acutely or chronically. And transplant provides a opportunity to restore function in these vital organs. They can improve patients' quality of life. Um, and so not only survival, but how patients feel and their overall you know, status. And you know, ultimately in some patients, you can get them back to productivity and contribution to society, which is one of the rationale. And you know, there have been several analyses that have been done to look at costs of transplant. Transplant is an expensive endeavor. But overall, doing a transplant versus taking care of somebody with a chronic, uh, you know, uh, organ failure, transplant saves money for the healthcare system. So you can take a patient like this. This is a patient with, who's in need of a liver transplant. You can see they're jaundiced. They have a belly full of fluid. Um, you know, their umbilicus is popping out because they're so, uh, you know, so uh, sick with their liver disease. And you know, over time, or after a transplant, they can turn into you know, a normal functioning person that you would see out in a park. And this is actually a picture of one of the longest serving, uh, surviving transplant recipients, liver transplant recipients in the world. He's, he's, I think he's 28 years post liver transplant at this point. So, you know, uh, this is kind of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are the benefits. And the goal is, can we get transplants to the people that need them? Next. So as I mentioned earlier, the organ shortage emerged in the 1990s. Um, and uh, you know, this was a secondary to wider application of transplantation. Um, the increased demands, there was restrictions on supply. So this is some of the things that Wesley will talk about. So the number and quality of deceased donors is going down or you know, kind of mean, or, or stalling. The population in the US is aging as we know, getting more obese as we know, and getting more comorbidities. And therefore, you know, over time, and this graph shows in, in liver transplants, the number of transplants have kind of risen slowly, but the number of people needing a liver transplant 
um, has widened and that gap is widened. This is old data, but this is still consistent. And up to 20% of patients waiting on the wait list will be removed because they're too sick or they die before they can get their liver transplant. And that, that amounts to thousands of lives a year. Next slide. So how do you procure and allocate organs? This is, a, you know, this is the, the conundrum that we, that we live in. Um, and you, you, what we have to realize is that the organ transplant, transplantation system was set up by very smart people, but there's restrictions on how we can you know, get the organs from uh, people that die. That's where most of the organs that we get in the US come from, from donor families to move the organ to the recipient. And then how do you prioritize who gets those organs? Is it who needs it the most, the person who benefits the most, the person who gets the most, is the most benefit to society, which is, you know, as you can imagine, controversial, um, who waited the longest or some sort of lottery system. Um, and, you know, there's holes in our system. You know, I, I can think of one major example, Steve Jobs got a liver transplant. But he went to Tennessee um, to get it, and he exploited a hole in the system that we have. And you can see the country is big. And so if somebody dies in California, where do you send those organs? How far can they travel? You have to take into account lots of logistics like um, airports and roads and infrastructure and the amount of time the organ can stay um, outside the body and good. And so this is, a, you know, this is not a medical problem. This is an engineering problem. And this is some of the stuff that work that we've done. So um, this is just a brief overview. The other uh, complexity here is human behavior, um, which is tough. This is uh, an analysis that Luke had done uh, early, or, or last year, or earlier this year, that looked at variation um, and donor usage, um, even within a single geographic area in the country. And you can look at the graph here, and each box represents a, a different area of the country, and that the, the variation is the year-on-year -year variation over the years that we study. And you can see these boxes are huge. So not only does it vary geographically or vary um, you know, by uh, the, the organ utilization, vary um, by center you look at, but year-on-year -year it can vary significantly. So these um, uh, complexities include ethical, logistical, and behavioral components that, are, you know, that uh, need, a, need, a, need a multidisciplinary team to figure out. And with that, I guess we will get to uh, Wesley, who is going to now introduce to us uh, our first work we did on this subject. Thank you, Nihar. Thank you, Maria. Right, so how do we forecast organ donor shortage? Next slide, please. Elaborating a little about what Nihar was mentioning. So why were we interested? So like Mario said, this is work we did back in 2015, 2017. So why were we interested in predicting supply and demand? Well, we wanted to understand better what was the problem before addressing the problem. And as Nihar was mentioning, you can visualize this graph here on the left like a continuation of the graph we saw a few slides before. So the disparity among the supply and demand of livers has remained relatively constant over the last few years. So we have a shortage, we're not getting better. And among the possible causes for additions to the liver transplantation waiting list, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, had become an emerging indication for liver transplant. Next. And the problem with NASH is that it might lead to cirrhosis and chronic liver disease for which there's no cure. So it all starts with accumulated fat in the liver and it starts getting worse and worse and worse until you get up to a point that you cannot do anything to go back. Next slide. So with this in mind, we have two main research goals. First, predict the availability of organ donors for liver transplantation, so we're focusing here on liver donors, and investigate the impact of utilization changes, going back to this idea of liver utilization that Nihar was talking about, BMI or body mass index, and different population projections from the US census on future liver availability. And second, forecast the demand of organ donors, again, for liver transplantation, and examine the temporal trend behind additions to the waiting list due to NASH and the obese population in the United States. Next. 
So let's start with the first research goal. As you might have guessed, all of our work is data-driven, and we use data for multiple data sources, including the US Census, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the Organ Procurement Representation Network Database, and the Behavioral Risk Factor Trailing System. And this is just to model and forecast liver supply and demand. And for this section of our talk, we focus on adult disease donors with ages between 18 and 84, who had at least a segment, so at least half or a part of their liver, recovered for transplantation purposes. So this does not mean that the liver was actually transplanted, but it means that someone donated it for that purposes. Next slide. At a high level, our model for liver supply can be summarized in this slide. We model liver organ donors for liver transplantation as a function of demographic shifts. So we started with population projections from the US Census, so these are exogenous, we did not do anything about them, we just took them from the US Census, and we divided the population by obesity rate using data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So we divided the population into non-obese and obese. Then we applied donation rates using data from the Organ Procurement Representation Network, or OBTN, which is defined as the total number of transplants divided by the total population in the US. And then we applied liver utilization rates, which are defined as the total number of liver transplants divided by the total transplants in the US to get our liver donor forecast. And this model has three assumptions underneath. First, we're assuming that the correlation induced by the US census projections represent the actual correlation among future population. So what this means is that we believed that the US census projections were right, were correct. Second, we assume that donation rates will not change dramatically over the next 10 years. And third, a similar assumption for liberal utilization rates. They will remain relatively constant over the next 10 years. So with these assumptions and our overall model, we developed the following projections. Here, we're using the average donation rate from 2008 to 2012. And in this plot, in the x-axis, in the horizontal axis, we have our time, we have different years. And in the y-axis, we have the number of liver donors. And we were interested in three different types of projections. First, assuming the best liver utilization rate in our data set, which is probably unlikely using the average liver utilization rate, which is more likely, or using the worst liver utilization rate, which is also somewhat likely. And we find that our base case projection, so using the average, is quite similar to assuming the worst liver utilization rate. So in that sense, our projections were quite basic. And, but we see that assuming the best utilization rate is quite high. So probably that's not the right one. Next slide. And at that point, we started to think of to ourselves, what, what is the effect of our assumptions? And we studied the insensitivity analysis, the effect of changing incrementally liver utilization rate, changing body mass index rate of change, and changing which type of census projection we took as our overall truth. Here, once again, all the plots in the x-axis we have on time, and in the y-axis we have the number of liver donors. And we find that changing the rate of change of BMI or the US census projection, it doesn't have a big effect. However, changing the liver utilization rates over time does have a greater effect. And we also did a sensitivity analysis using uh, stochastic simulation, so a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And we have two big assumptions. First, we assume normality in our parameters um, for simplicity. And second, we assume that, again, the past is similar to the future. So we could randomly sample historical donation and utilization rates, and those will represent the future. 
And with these parameters, we get the following predictions. Here, once again, we have in the x-axis time, y-axis number of labor donors. And we find that these projections are quite similar to what we saw in our base case. And until now, it seems that I'm giving you all good news. Well, all the lines are going up with the exception of assuming worse labor optimization rate over time, ah, but not quite. If we scale these projections by the expected population growth, the line is actually going downwards. So in the right-hand side, here we have time one more time in the x-axis and the number of disease donors per population on the y-axis. And we see that even though we're expecting an increase in liver donors, we're actually expecting a decrease in liver donors per population. So the picture was not quite good. Interventions were needed to address this. So let's now move on to our second research. Forecast the demand of organ donors for liver transplantation and examine the temporal trend behind additions to the waiting list due to NASH and the obese population in the United States. And at a high level, this is our model. Since historically, we were seeing that the obese population was increasing almost linearly in time, statistically speaking, was a beautiful line. From a public health perspective, very concerning. We used time in years to predict obese population at a specific year. And then since we're assuming that there is some time of delay effect between obesity and addition to the waiting list due to NASH, we will use obese population, say today, a year K, to predict the addition to the waiting list due to NASH L years later. Next slide. And there are some, there are three underlying assumptions in this model. First, we're assuming that obese population is going to continue to increase. We, of course, vary this in sensitivity analysis. I'm not going to go into that, but feel free to check out our paper. Second, additions to the waiting list for liver transplantation are at least partially driven by obesity in the populations, and that's a big assumption. Third, there is a temporal trend behind additions to the waiting list due to NASH and obese population. So we can quantify it because it exists. Next slide. And for some, for those of you who wanted to see at least some equations, these are the two slides for you. At a high level, if we predicted obese population using time, using a linear regression equation. Again, this idea that obese population, the obese population was actually increasing quite linearly over time. And if we knew the obese population historically, then we predicted additions, next slide, additions to the winning list due to NASH using the obese population L years before. So if we knew the obese population from our data set, we used linear regression. However, if, next slide, if we did not have obese population um, known, we had to project it, we had to predict it, we do not have closed form solution for prediction intervals anymore. So for that case, we use stochastic simulation and a, quite a similar equation, assuming a t-distribution to forecast additions to the waiting list due to NASH. Next slide. And these are our main results. We evaluated several different time lags in years. And we found that nine years, so obese population nine years before is, associ is best associated with additions to the waiting list due to NASH today. And we found that even though our quantities were in, the, in thousands, our training error and testing error were quite small, below 1% and the adjusted R square is 90%. So at least the statistic fit was pretty good. Our assumption of linearity was not that crazy after all. Next slide. And these are our main results. Here in the x-axis, we have time, one more time. And in the y-axis, we have the addition to the waiting list due to NASH. The last part of the plot 
before the red dash vertical red, red dash line, we obtain using linear regression. The second part, you obtain using stochastic simulation. And we estimated that in 2016, around 1,300 additions to the wind and the due to Nash. And in 2030, we're estimated around 2,300 additions to the wind and the due to Nash. Next slide. So with this, I would like to conclude this section of our talk. But before I conclude, two practical implications for our work. First, further aggravation of the donor shortage that Nihar was discussing at the beginning of the talk for liver transplantation is expected over the next decade. So bad news, and even more bad news, the demand for liver transplantation due to NASH is expected to increase given the population obesity trends. And if you are curious and would like to know more about our papers, you can either reach out to us or ask us, ask us questions or follow the QR codes on for our papers. You're more than welcome to reach out for questions. Uh, David? Thanks, Wesley. So um, next, we've been talking about kind of supply and demand and looking at trends. And I think the next question is, well, what can we do about this? And so I'm gonna talk about changing donation rates and in particular one, one potential intervention to do that. And I'll talk about the economics of it and then I'll pass it on along to Luke to talk about some more details about this. So let's look at the next slide here. And the, the policy we're gonna examine, and there, there are many things you can look at to in, increase donor um, donation rates, but the one we're gonna focus on today is something called presumed consent. And if you think about today, in most states, if you're signing up for your driver's license, there's a little checkbox. Would you like to be an organ donor? And the, and the checkbox is open, and, and you have to actually do the check mark to check it off. What presumed consent is moving to an opt-out um, or the assumption that you will be an organ donor to start with. Um, and so you have the checkbox that's already checked for you, and you have to uncheck it. You have to actively work to, to not be an organ donor. And there's quite a bit of uh, literature and kind of psychology about this, how this might be a kind of subtle nudge that might increase the rates of people becoming, in this case, becoming organ donors, and then presumably giving us more organs um, to help alleviate some of that shortage. There's been a little bit of research to try to understand how big of an impact that might be. Um, it's difficult to understand this, though, because there aren't any randomized controlled trials where we randomize people to get a checkbox and randomize other people to or the open checkbox and other, randomize other people to get the, the checked off checkbox. Um, but what we can do, and when what this study at the bottom here is done, Ruthalia et al. has done, is they've looked at various countries and compared countries um, that do and don't have this presumed consent policy. And in this graph here are some uh, three areas or three countries that have moved from, um, from not having presumed consent to having a presumed consent model. So the blue bar is before and the orange bar is after. And you can see the donation rates actually look like they've increased dramatically in all three of these cases in Austria, Belgium, and Singapore. With that said, it's unclear that the U.S. would receive that kind of increase if we were to do that here in the United States. Um, so what we first did is we tried to do an economic analysis to understand if we just had a 5% increase in deceased donor transplants, how valuable would that be economically in the United States? And the key thing here is people, we were focusing on kidney transplant because that's the most commonly tra transplanted organ. And people on, who in need of kidney transplant right now can live with dialysis. So they're going into the dialysis clinic, you know, three times a week for several hours um, and the dialysis machines are cleaning their blood, kind of like ki kidneys would filter their blood. That's very expensive. It's you know, close to $100,000 a year for someone to live on dialysis. It's quite expensive. And the quality of life isn't great with it either. But now if we can get someone onto transplant, as Nihar said at the beginning here, um, the transplant itself is very expensive. But every year thereafter, instead of spending $100,000, you might only, maybe you're only spending $30,000 or so per year with the transplant. And so there might be some cost savings if we can get more people out of dialysis and into transplant. So we built a mathematical model simulating uh, people who would get transplants, different types of transplants and survive and die and, and maybe their transplants would fail and so forth. 
and we calculated an economic impact of what this might look like. And we figured that increasing deceased donor kidney donation by just 5% would save $4.7 billion over the lifetime of the people on the waiting list today. Um, but policies increasing deceased do donating, um, so we can think about it that way, you know, $4.7 billion. But another way to think about it might be that if you were to increase that deceased kidney donation by 5%, Another way to think about it is you could just pay donor estates $8,000 per donor and it would still be cost saving. So we think there's tremendous economic impact that could be had if we could increase those donor rates by just a small amount like 5%. So now I'm moving on to Luke who will dig into some more of the details of what that might look like um, if we had an increase in presumed consent organ donations. Thanks, yeah, I stole, um... I stole one of Dr. Hutton's slides and I wanted to use it as my intro because when, when I look at this slide, right, we look at this before and after for presumed consent and it's, it's a pretty subtle change, right? You simply say, no thanks, I don't wanna be an organ donor instead of, yeah, I'd like to be an organ donor. Something really subtle we saw in you know, several countries has this big impact. And so in terms of donation rates at least. And so I, I think you know, the first time for me personally, I saw something like this. I'm like, well, heck yeah, like why not? Why wouldn't we do a policy like this right away? And I think one thing that's really interesting, you know, as an engineer that I think about a lot is, and I, and I think I'm sure everyone in this room thinks about a lot is, well, our ultimate goal, what is our ultimate goal? We'd like to increase donation rates, but more importantly, we'd, we'd like to impact patients positively, right? And we'd like to look at policies that impact patients. And so in the literature, what our team found was, you know, some, some discussion, not a lot on how it would impact donation rates, but really not a lot translating that into, well, what does this really mean for patients? So some metrics that we might think about for organ donation are things like, well, how many people die while they're on the wait list? That's a pretty important metric. It's a life or death metric, right? How big are the wait list sizes that can determine how long you're waiting or um, which regions maybe are having harder times getting donations or things like that. And so these metrics were much closer to the patient experience. And so, um, and also beyond that, you know, in these countries, there's other things going on. So what we really knew from this paper and other things in the literature is, you know, presumed consent was associated with anywhere from a 5% increase to a 25% increase in donation rates. That's just one lever that we can pull. And so what we did next was we built a simulation model to say, well, how does this actually translate to patient metrics? So this is an overview of what we did. We built a discrete time simulation model. In our case, our periods were months. So we looked at the wait list every month. <clears throat> and what's gonna happen is patients are added and patients are removed. Patients being added, there's really one sort of flow into our model in that way. But if you're removed, you're removed for one of four reasons, generally. Um, either you die or become too sick to receive a transplant and you've never, you know, never got what you were hoping for, worst case scenario. You can receive a donor transplant, either a living donor transplant or a deceased donor transplant. Um, or you could be removed for any other reason. Like <clears throat> let's, again, this is very US centric. So if you moved, um, to a different country or if you got better and you no longer needed a transplant. And what presumed consent really would impact is it would increase this number of deceased donor transplants. <clears throat> and you can imagine as we would increase the number of deceased donor transplants, well, that's gonna go up. Well, there's gonna be ripple effects throughout the system. So we started looking at, well, how would other things go down or how might things be adjusted? <clears throat> For our data sources, I use similar ones to that Wesley sort of looked at. Organ transplants, I think if you're interested, it's a really cool space because a lot of the data is centrally recorded and, and available more or less publicly. So we used information on waitlist histories for different regions um, monthly over time. And like Wesley alluded to earlier, um, we also considered things like organ yield. So just because someone donates doesn't mean it actually gets transplanted. Maybe um, there was no one to receive the organ in time, maybe something went wrong with the procurement surgery or, or something like that. And then the third thing we really wanted to think about was survival benefit. So um, like Dr. Parikh alluded to earlier, every time you receive a transplant, you know, you can add, you can add years onto your life. And this is one important metric that we wanted to look at. Well, donation rates means more donors, but what does it mean in terms of survival and life? 
The other big thing that we had to think about also Dr. Um, Parikh alluded to is, well, who gets these additional organs? So if we have somewhere between five and 25% um, additional organ donations, where do they go? And um, this system is complex. And if it sounds complex now, I promise it's more complex than any of us realize because you could imagine someone donates an organ and let's say you're top of the list for whatever reason, you're the sickest or you've been waiting the longest, but maybe you didn't pick up your phone when they called or maybe you had a comorbidity that just said, oh, I'm out of town right now and I can't get back or I'm too sick or there's, I mean, anything could happen. And, um, there's an infinite number of situations. So we couldn't really perfectly model allocation because it's so human. And so what we did instead was we modeled a range of allocations. So we sort of have two scenarios here. The first one is random allocation. That would be just every organization roll a you know, 13,000 sided dice and that's who um, gets the, um, that's who gets the organ. Uh, generally, I mean, you could argue we can do better than random, um, but this would essentially be like a worst case scenario. It's not really focused on um, patient health metrics. The other one would be an ideal allocation. So imagine you knew, you could just look at a patient and you knew exactly what was gonna happen to them. You could see into the future and you could argue that the ideal situation was you'd give the organ to the patient that needs it the most. So the patient that would die, you could prevent the most deaths, you could add the most survival, that would really be this ideal allocation. And the thought is we're somewhere in between these two ranges. And so sort of with that in mind, um, I can start talking about some of the results we have from our model. The first metric we focused on is the number of people who are removed from the wait list due to death or illness. So they, they never received a transplant, they were added, but unfortunately they were too sick. Our x-axis here, you're seeing the time period. So again, this is a little bit older of a study. We modeled um, 2004 to 2015, and we did this as a retroactive study. So this is a big, what if presumed consent had been in place from 2004 to 2015? And in this case, we're being pretty conservative. So I talked about a five to 25% increase in donation rates, but we just said, let's assume the low end of this, just a 5% increase in donation rates. And with that alone, you know, we're looking at all organs, um, all solid organs here. We would expect a three to 10% reduction in the number of people that are removed due to death or illness from the wait list. So three to 10% reduction in the number of deaths. When about over this time frame, about 7,000 people died um, without ever receiving an organ. So that's a big impact in terms of number of lives saved. Breaking this down um, a little bit more. So these are the same data feeding into this table, but here we can look at it by individual organs and we can look at it over a different, here I'm calling them impact, but impact would be the more or less the increase in donation rates. So you can see at the bottom combined all organs, 5% impact. That's that three to 10% I just talked about. But if we got something like the 25% impact, and you saw that many countries had huge increases in organ donation, right? In an ideal allocation, you could see as many as half of the deaths um, would be prevented due to this increase of organ donation due to presumed consent. That's the estimation by our model. A lot of this is driven by um, kidney donations, um, simply because kidney donations are really the highest volume. The other metric we looked at was something called was weightless size. Um, so I talked about weightless size being a big metric. And this one really sort of threw us for a loop when we first found it, because what we saw was in an ideal allocation, if you implemented presumed consent, even if you increased it um, to 25, 25% extra donors, here I'm showing 5%, the weightless size wouldn't go down at all. And this is not really what you would expect. And this takes a little bit of thinking to, to get to why, but you can imagine, how do I reduce my waitlist size? Well, I the people rem are removed from it. And you could have less people added, but in our case, we're saying more people being removed. Well, there's multiple ways to be removed. I talked about being sick or dying is one way to leave the waitlist and then receiving a transplant is a different one. In our ideal allocation, the sickest people would receive these additional donations, but that person was going to leave the waitlist anyway. So, if I wanted to, let's say, game the system or game this metric of waitlist size, what I would actually do instead is I would let that person die and then give the organ to someone healthy. So that way I have two people leaving my waitlist instead of one. 
Now, this is horribly unethical. No one would do this. I'm not suggesting anyone's going to do this. But it, for me, I mean, I think a lot of people, right, metrics matter. <laughs> metrics matter a lot. And so when we're thinking about this as a representation of the impact of a policy, right, we could say, well, maybe weightless size isn't the right one to consider, or we need to consider it in the bigger picture. And so, in fact, you're not going to reduce the weightless size until you save everyone's life. And then the extra organs would start reducing the weightless size. And that's, I think, a great goal. Um, but here we sort of, it took us a minute to be like, are we really looking at um, the right things? The third metric that we looked at um, in detail was this idea of life years gained. Uh, I talked about it earlier as survival benefit, right? So every time you receive a transplant, you add X number of years onto your life. And what we saw was that presumed consent, um, even if it didn't change the weightless size, right, um, under these different allocations and all across our range could um, add as many as 4,000 to 34,000 life years gained annually. So this is, again, people getting to spend time with their families or um, into society or just, you know, living. And so in this way, presumed consent, our model estimates could have a, a pretty big impact on public health. So just the, really the big takeaways from this project, you know, presumed consent alone, as we saw, it's, it's not going to solve U.S. organ shortages, or at least per, per our model. Um, it doesn't seem to be that case, right? We're not even going to really reduce the waitlist size necessarily, but it still can result in large gains in life years. And for that reason, further public discourse about whether or not presumed consent is ethical, logistically valid, is appropriate. And I think one of the things, I'm just going to brag about our team a little bit, because I'm really proud of this, but we actually, um, we had a state uh, legislator from Rhode Island reach out to us about this paper and ask us to testify in front of a Rhode Island state legislature. And I just thought that was like a, a really, for me, I'm very young in my career. I have these great role models. And I just think it was amazing, like example of the things that we can do can really, people read them, they absorb them and, and try to turn them into policy. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Luke. So I am uh, have the task of finally uh, finishing this talk and uh, it's gonna be brief. I just wanna give you, we have had uh, our team present. And as you can see, we just talked about four papers today. The first part of today's talk uh, was geared towards just understanding the problem before one can even tackle and think how can one change things. It was mostly thinking of, well, how does supply look like? How do we forecast it? How does demand look like? And how, what changes do we expect in the future? And even doing something like that took us quite a bit of time to get the right data in the right location, the right to actually be able to trust the models we were creating. And then after that, our team late as of lately, and uh, the, the paper Luke described to you was, uh, it's a little bit younger, but uh, older. But um, in general, we have been thinking of potential changes one can make to the system to really, address this imbalance that we are seeing. And so he talked about implied consent, but there are others that one could do. Today's presentation has been based on a four of our papers and uh, I'm happy to share the presentation with all of you if you're interested. And uh, I wanna mention that on top of that, we have other work. Here's some of the work we have done that's already published. Uh, part of it has been the idea of uh, organ utilization and uh, discarding organs. Not every location will do the same decisions when they discard organs. And so which organs are discarded and why has been part of our analysis. In addition, we have also done work on understanding the procurement organizations. There has been discussions as to, well, what would happen if uh, they, they did redistribution of those, of, of those organizations we did, and so we decided to do some work into how would that impact our imbalance. There's also been talked about metrics and uh, Luke and uh, Nihar both uh, mentioned it. There is a uh, metrics to drive how organizations behave. And so our work in there was thinking of, well, how do different locations, how do different metrics change the way that, look, that different organizations may behave? So that's the other paper we have there. And at the moment, we continue doing other work, thinking of other <laughs> changes that one could do. For instance, uh, 
And I should mention some of the students that may be joining us today. We have thinking um, the whole idea of implied consent, while it's really great, it's, we have learned it's a really hard sell to say, let's just change the entire way that uh, our nation works. But something that may not be as hard to change is the idea of um, renewal. So once you say that you will be an organ donor, do you need to say again that you will be an organ donor next time that you get your driver's license? And what we have learned is that in some places and some states, they do, uh, they do that have automatically, once you say yes, you continue being yes. While in other places and other states, they don't do that. And uh, the way we have learned about it, um, Luke was saying, and I think Luke or Wesley were saying how easy it is to get some of the data. I can tell you that this one has not been easy. And so we have had students uh, learn about <laughs> both from School of Public Health and from engineering, calling all those the drive, DMVs, driver license offices, and ask, really trying to understand legislature of each of our states to see, well, does that actually make a difference into donation rates and hopefully long-term lives of the patients? So with that being said, I, wanna, I was told I should leave some time for questions. So we are all here to answer your questions and thanks again for being flexible in letting us present online today and for speaking with us throughout this whole presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Um, we've got lots of good questions on the cards and I'm hoping this is not a shy group. So I'm gonna open it up to the room for the first question. And then Stephanie, if you can be watching the chat to see if anybody online has questions. Emma, are you ready to go? Yeah, your eyes are lit up. <laughs> so for the um, liver transplantation uh, study predicting um, sort of the gap between the, the demand and the supply, uh, one of your assumptions was that the liver utilization would, like the percent liver utilization would stay the same, but would the increase in obesity like have an impact on the liver utilization because of like healthy livers um, in the population, and if that doesn't have a significant impact, what are some other factors that might have a significant impact on that liver utilization potential? I can take that question. Okay. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons we examined the possibility of varying liver utilization. So how, how things looked back then was that obesity was expected to keep growing over time in, in, the, in the US. But when we looked at the liver utilization rates, they did not change that much, historically speaking. Like once we did a sensitivity analysis, increasing it uh, or decreasing it, over time, we saw that the impact was, was huge. In terms of um, things that, to the second part of your question, things that could impact liver utilization, well, something like presumed consent could impact utilization, for example, or anything that could. So how utilization, uh, as a reminder, utilization is calculated as the total number of, of livers transplanted over the total number of transplants, so of all the organs. So if you can recover somehow more livers or less livers that while keeping the rest, and what, what I mean by the rest is pretty much keeping kidneys constant because kidneys is the largest um, organ that is transplanted, uh, that would have a, a considerable impact in liver utilization. Thank you. Did, did that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. And Eileen, if you are um, muted, if you could unmute and go ahead and ask your question from the chat as well. Can't tell, what, was that a public chat? Yeah. So you might be able to see the question um, that's posted in the chat, Marielle and team. This is the question about uh, organ donation hesitancy. Yes, please. Yeah. So the question is, what are statistics 
for organ donation hesitancy, particularly in underrepresented communities. <clears throat> Are there any correlations between organ donation hesitancy and supply levels? Um, so, yes, the others can can add to this, but I mean, my my understanding is that. Um, there are differences in rates of organ donation in, in various communities across the United States. Um, one difference that has been noted is that um, I think donation rates from African Americans might be a little bit lower than from Caucasians. And I think um, there's quite a bit of demand in African Americans, particularly for, for kidneys. And so there's kind of an imbalance in supply and demand there. And, and sometimes uh, sometimes there can be good matches with race, and so that can lead to an imbalance. Um, my my co-authors here can can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I, I don't know if we I don't know particularly too much about hesitancy. Um, besides that, the, just that the rates are lower. Um, some of that might be driven by structural factors and by um, mistrust of the medical system. Um, and I, I presume if you don't. If you don't trust doctors and you think that doctors are trying to get you to sign something so they can, you know, pull the plug on you and 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 harvest your organs or like that, um, that could lead to some hesitancy. Um, I don't know if my co-authors have anything they want to, my colleagues have anything they want to say here about that. Yeah, we. I mean, we definitely, like Dr. Hutt mentioned, our work focuses mostly on these rates. Um, but what we often find is even when when we control for lots of factors like. Um, population sizes or age, um, BMI, like a number of factors. And then if we throw race and ethnicity in there as well, what we find is that even controlling for all of these other things like health background, dem other demographics, we do find that in underrepresented communities, these rates are very different. And in the literature, sort of beyond the scope of some of what we've done, we find often this is attributed to it's, it's hard to put your finger on because when we talk about like this idea of um, people like to say hesitancy and I think often because um, it's a common topic that comes up. So I would say it's most often attributed to hesitancy, but other people will argue, well, you know, if there's a higher demand, it's kind of like the obesity issue, like as more people become obese, like um, we need more transplants, but also we have fewer donors. That's kind of like what the first question was alluding to. But similarly within some communities, do we say like, well, is there a, this discrepancy be, be, between supply and demand because of some other health characteristic that's correlated with ethnicity? I won't say it's caused by ethnicity, but it's correlated with ethnicity. Um, and is that driving it or is hesitancy driving it? So there aren't, there's great statistics on differences in donation rates. Um, underrepresented communities tend to um, donate less. Whether or not it's the root cause is, um, I would say, still up in the air. Yeah, I mean, I just add a, just a brief thing to that, that it, it is complex. This, 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 you know, and what we found was that, you know, minorities donate less, but, this, you know, this may be due to structural factors as well in the way that we approach minorities. There may not be culturally appropriate um, or, you know, centered ways that we approach them. The, the organ procurement organizations, which are the organizations that actually go out into the community and, and consent donors, um, you know, may not um, do so um, as rigorously in you know uh, you know minority communities, uh, for example, or may not you know uh, tailor their uh, consent process uh, in a culturally appropriate manner. So there, this is complex. Hesitancy is a loaded word, um, and you know, uh, but it, but but there's probably several sides to this. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If someone in the room, yeah, go ahead. Um, nice and loud from the back. So I was wondering, I know it's like but how do cities Were able to we couldn't hear that. Could you uh, repeat it maybe closer to the front? Yeah, come on up. That's probably easiest. <laughs> okay, so the, the question had to do, I'm going to try and paraphrase, um, maybe at the highest level, there is incentive uh, commercially for organizations that run dialysis who profit from it. How do they factor into uh, 
can you rate him? Was there something specific? I kind of missed the last piece. Yeah, I was just wondering how companies prioritize um, dialysis and patients with organ failure. Because that's really important. Um, and then I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, but in terms of the first question about for-profit dialysis centers, there have been several analyses that have shown that they have, do have a lower rate of referral for transplant. Um, for, and this is one of the disparities that we see. I mean, this is kind of one of the dirtiest parts of our healthcare system. But, um, you know, the, the, there are multiple stakeholders when you think about people with chronic liver disease. And they are certainly one that, um, you know, impact the uh, referral rate for transplantation. So certainly that's something that's been, that's out there and been described in the literature in several analyses. I'm not sure if there was a second part of that question. Nihar, can you say anything about how that's regulated, if you if you know? It's, a, you know, it's a, sadly it's not. You know, we don't have really a great public health system for this at this point. Um, and so um, there's not any kind of signal or regulation that happens on that level of referral to organ transplant. And this is one of the disparities that we see that's very difficult to quantify. Um, when we talk about transplant is, we have this great data set that I think several of the members have alluded to, which is the UNOS data set, which takes people that are listed um, and looks at their transplant rates and things like that. But to get to that, to get on that, to get there, you have to be referred for a transplant in the first place. And getting that denominator um, is difficult. And you know, and what's even more difficult is any kind of public health intervention within that that group of patients um, that never get referred. Uh, for example, dialysis centers. So. Um, this is an issue and, you know, um, something that uh, several groups have talked about in terms of ways to look at uh, quality and metrics in this population. Yeah, thank you for that. Go ahead. And one, just to add to that, to give a little bit of color to this. By the way, I'm going to tell a story that I don't think is widespread, but I read it in a, in a news article, and I think it was in the news because it was hopefully rare. But there was a story about a dialysis clinic, and they were they were kind of building community within their dialysis center. And remember, people are coming in three times a week, spending several hours every time they're there. And so they were kind of building community within their dialysis center, and and they were really promoting that within their center. And um, I think it turned ugly, actually, a little bit, um, but subtly, because they were saying, "Look, you're part of this dialysis community. You don't you don't want to leave our community, do you?" You don't want to get a transplant and leave us. You like coming here all the time and, and being part of our this group here with dialysis. And, and they were kind of subtly discouraging people from getting a transplant, saying, you know, hey, kind of stay here with us in the dialysis center. Um, so I think there could be, you know, some subtle things like that. There certainly is a financial incentive for the dialysis centers to kind of keep people there, especially if they're a private privately paid, um, not, not under Medicare or Medicaid or something. Um, so there are, but as, like as Nihar said, there's, there's very little regulation of this. Um, and so, you know, those, sometimes those financial incentives can, um, you know, force, you know, push people in the wrong direction. Yeah, and, and, and thanks uh, to you both for mentioning that. I know that there's been work, some of our other collaborators at Michigan Medicine have looked not just with transplant, but with other pretty significant surgeries about the decision-making associated with who is a viable candidate um, and, and whether a particularly um, uh, high-risk procedure is appropriate for somebody. And there, there seem to potentially be disparities in how those, those judgments are made as well. So for the sake of time, I wanna go ahead and thank all of our speakers um, and thank you all for your questions. And we look forward to another great session next week. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.